I, I can add you minutes if that's me. You can say it out on here if you want, but obviously you don't, then you have to record it, so I probably wouldn't. <laughs> Right, so the, the webinar will go live at one o'clock, so bear that in mind. I'll just do the big spiel and I'll hand over to you, Elise. I think I've made you group up. admin on the group. Do you think you can add people then? Yeah, thank um, you. I've got Matt. I don't think I've got Alison. I will send you my mobile number now. Thanks, Matt. I've got lots of Alisons, but not you. I've put you in, Matt. There we go. I've emailed it over to you. It should be arriving. Cool. Okay. Right in a minute. Charlotte, do you want to put your slide onto? Um, oh, yes. Thank you. Did. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. This is really exciting. I press start recording now, and then I'll give it a couple of seconds for everyone to join in. Enjoy. Right. Good afternoon to everyone joining. Um, we'll just give it a few seconds so that everybody um, can get on to the start and then we'll kick off. Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second Community Oncology webinar. I'm Charlotte Stevenson. And I'm a business development manager at Cardiff University, and it's my role to support these types of activities. Just a few quick housekeepings before we get going um, with the session today. We've got the chat function available. If you have any problems, sound problems, you want to talk to the team, um, just pop anything in there. And we've also got the Q&A. Um, we'll have a session at the end where you can ask any questions. So just pop them in there and we'll make sure to pose them to our speakers at the end. And we're working in all various different locations today. So please bear with us if there's any technical problems, comedy talking on mute or annoying noise from the scaffolders next door. Um, in order for us to continue this type of activity, we do really need the feedback from you. There'll be a QR code at the end and I'll also be emailing out a link to the feedback survey and we would really appreciate it if you take a few moments to fill that in. And um, that's enough from me today. Um, I'm going to pass over to our fantastic community oncology team. Enjoy. Great, thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, my name's Fiona Rawlinson. I'm a programme director for the postgraduate palliative care courses in Cardiff University. But I've also worked with colleagues Elise Lang and Mick Button over the last three years to develop the Com Community Oncology series. We should have been uh, delivering these sessions face to face last year. But if you recall this time last year, so, so some quite big things were beginning to happen. So we've been delighted to be able to share some of the knowledge, experience, learning and discussion in this webinar series. Um, you, you're from a, a wide variety of, of locations and we hope that we've got a really inclusive collection of roles. So we've done a couple of polls just before we get on to the, the, the real nitty gritty of the, um, of, the, of the session, just really for us to understand where each other is coming from. So. Um, Jess, I wonder if you could launch the first poll, please, which is just asking you what is your main what is your main role? Where are you Where are you joining us from? Are you a GP? Are you a practice nurse or a district nurse or a nurse practitioner? Um, so, do uh, vote. Uh, yeah, <laughs> place your place your vote, ladies and gentlemen. Do let us know where where you are where you are joining us. What is your role to to join us today? It's fantastic. Wonderful. So diff lots of different backgrounds for this week, which is great. Majority from, from general practice or GP trainees, but everybody is welcome. And what you're going to hear through the session, you may well come at this from completely, have a completely different question to anybody else. There is no question that should, that should not be asked. So please feel able to ask those questions. But the other thing we'd be really interested to know is where you're from. Are you mostly from Wales or have you joined us from, from elsewhere as well? So do please let us know and please forgive us. Somewhere else last time was Gibraltar and was from Pakistan. So do please forgive us for somewhere else. We would be very interested if you are from somewhere else for you to put in the chat where you're from, because as I say, you're all very welcome. 
and bringing your learning and your experience from your background will also help the session to be really interactive. Just while you're finishing, just while you're finishing that, we've got somebody from India, lovely, thank you. So majority from Wales, but thank you. Some from England, some from Europe, and some from somewhere else, one of which is India, I've seen from the chat. So one last thing from me before handing over to Elise and Gibraltar, welcome Gibraltar, um, is that the, the, the chat is somewhere where, where you can put comments if something is not working for you. The question and answer, um, do please put your questions there. We will spend time at the end following those questions. So if there's a question about something that we can answer immediately, we'll answer immediately. Otherwise, don't be alarmed if your question sits there because right at the end of the session, we've allocated some time and we'll bring all the questions in at that point to the panel. So have a think as we start the session, just think about the people you look after. Think about the people who you are wondering if they've got lung cancer, if you're looking after somebody with lung cancer. Think about what sort of questions that you ask yourself when you're helping to manage those patients. And we hope very much that this seminar, this webinar will help you. Elise, I'm gonna hand over to you. Oh, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining again today. Um, we had some really positive feedback from last week, as, as Fiona was saying, we've got um, three more dates for the next three Wednesdays coming as well. Um, today, we've got three um, great speakers coming to you. We've got Dr. Matt Jones, who's a um, respiratory consultant in an Iron Bevan Health Board in South Wales. We've got Dr. Mick Button, who's an oncologist in Valindra Cancer Centre in Cardiff in South Wales. And Alison Edwards, who's a CNS, a senior nurse in Valindra Cancer Centre, specialising in lung cancer. So hopefully providing you some diverse information and things that will help you in primary care and working to improve both diagnostics of lung cancer and then management and ongoing care of patients who've had long, lung cancer. To kind of set the scene, we'd just like to play a brief clip from a patient's story that was um, on Valindra, um, one of their patient stories. So we've just got a couple of short sound bursts from this to share. Thank you, um, Charlotte. Despite trying this, I actually can't hear it. I don't know if anybody else can. I can't hear either. I'm here. I wonder if there's a sharing. I wonder, Charlotte, if the screen share, because we've moved into a different part of the meeting, the sound share might need to be adjusted again. This is this Zoom learning curve. This Zoom learning curve just keeps on giving. If there's any problem, Charlotte, we can always share the link. Yes, I think I think Maybe we can share the link at the end, at least, maybe. Yeah, no problem. Um, thank you for trying, Charlotte. That's a shame. It's it's a patient explaining, you know, what happened along her journey um, with, with from diagnostics and primary care through to diagnosis. And it would be well worth a listen if you get the chance later on. We will post the link. Thank you for trying, Charlotte. I mean, I think from primary care's point of view, um, Matt's going to explain very well some of the issues that we've had with patients not presenting for many reasons across the last year. Um, but also from how we manage patients when they present with a cough, um, you know, given that most of us are thinking COVID-19 at the moment, and I guess when to worry when the cough has been going on a little bit more. And also some of those sort of smaller red flag um, concerns that um, are in the NICE guidance that we should all be aware of. And I'm happy to share some of those links through the chat as well as the meeting goes on, but I shall pass to Matt Jones. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Elise. So yeah, my name is Dr. Matt Jones. I'm a lung cancer lead clinician uh, in ABHB. 
So I'm also a consultant chess physician, been working on the shop floor with uh, lots of COVID patients. So we had a busy year as we all have really. I get on my next slide. So this is all about lung cancer. It's a shame we couldn't hear Julie's story because I think that would have really painted the picture of, of what we're dealing with with lung cancer. We all know that uh, lung cancer is a big killer. It's, uh, it kills more patients per year than breast and bowel cancer combined. Recent estimates about 35,000 people each year. And the real shame of lung cancer is the majority of people present at a late stage when disease is advanced and treatment options are less. And really what we're trying to do as a community is try and bring people forward to present earlier. Um, it is difficult, but that is the goal with this. And, and how can we in primary care identify these patients really earlier on? So if I go to my next slide. So COVID-19 has completely changed the way we've worked over the last year. Um, and it's really affected everything. And cancer is one of those things we're seeing patients being diagnosed later, uh, less patients being diagnosed up front and delays in their treatment down the line. And some people migrating through different stages and perhaps going to more uh, palliative stages because of the delays from COVID-19. And lung cancer is one of the worst affected because of the shared similarities with the, the uh, respiratory virus of COVID-19. Uh, we're seeing more and more patients presenting late in hospital with lung cancer rather than through primary care. And I think it's going to be a legacy for many years now that we'll see an increase in lung cancer deaths uh, and really undoing a lot of the good work that's happened in the lung cancer community and the developments of the last few years. So I have my next slide. And lung cancer has been particularly badly affected because really lots of reasons. We've had conflicting messages. The kind of stay at home, help out uh, has been a very successful message coming through from the government. And that really kind of goes against years of lung cancer awareness campaigns where we said, actually, if you've got three weeks of a cough, see your GP, get that chest x-ray done quickly. You know, it's really trying to protect um, the medical fraternity from kind of non-urgent presentations, but then we are missing these patients. They're going to be misdiagnosed. Some thinking that they've got COVID-19, stay in a home, self-isolating, but some of those will be having lung cancer symptoms rather than that of COVID-19. And our services have certainly reduced in the way they're accessed, reduced in, in the way they're delivered. And it's the same in primary care. So there will be that effect also affecting why we're seeing less and less cases. So my next slide. This is a, a graph of really what we've been seeing in an Iron Bevan. The blue line is the referrals month on month in 2019. And the red line is comparing what it was in 2020. We can see that in April of last year, which was at the peak of the first wave, really the numbers of our referrals went grossly down, really it was 78% reduction compared to April of 2019. The referrals did increase up as the pandemic settled down, but then with the second wave, again, they, they dropped down immensely. And overall, we saw 39% reduction in suspected lung cancer referrals in 2020 compared to 20, 2019. So it was a huge reduction. And on my next slide, that shows actually the diagnoses themselves then. After that peak of the first wave, the numbers really bottomed out in May, a significant reduction in our diagnoses of lung cancer. And that has continued all throughout last year. And worse again, then in the second wave with the reduction in our numbers, into November and December. And really 22% less lung cancer diagnoses in 2020 compared to 2019. So you can see the legacy of COVID-19 infection there. And the next slide, it's been the same across Wales. We're not unique in an Iron Bevan. And this is just a slide showing the number of pathology samples in 2020 compared to 2019. And in each month after the start of the pandemic in February, it showed a reduction in the number of confirmed diagnoses consistent with what we're seeing with less and less patients presenting because of the pandemic. My next slide. So coming back to lung cancer itself, with COVID-19, we've seen a lot of patients presenting with cough, breathlessness, lots of symptoms, which could be those of lung cancer. Um, this was a study from uh, Exeter in 2005, very good study actually looking at uh, a number of um, practices within the Exeter cluster looking at those patients within there which had lung cancer, comparing those which didn't have lung cancer and other problems, and looking at 
particularly symptoms which were associated with lung cancer. And they picked out these seven core symptoms, cough, fatigue, breathlessness, chest pain, weight loss, appetite loss, and hemoptysis. And look, these have been strongly associated with lung cancer. Some of those, such as cough, you can see in lots of other conditions, recurrent infections, asthma, COPD. Um, so that actually has a very small positive predictive value of odds of getting lung cancer with just that symptom. But things like hemoptysis has a very strong association with lung cancer. The actual, if you just have one episode of hemoptysis, there's a 2.4 positive predictive value in, in association with lung cancer. It's quite high uh, in its association. And if you have two episodes, following this graph down the column there, if you have two episodes of hemoptysis, that positive predictive value of lung cancer from that is up to 17. So very, very high. And looking at this, you can also work out if you have a number of different symptoms, such as here, hemoptysis and loss of weight, then your positive predictive value goes up to 9.2. So you can see how these things work together. Trying to differentiate from COVID-19, what we're looking at is these are more chronic symptoms typically, whereas COVID tends to be acute symptoms but it's easy to see how the, those borders can be muddied. One particular physical sign that was picked up from this study was that of finger clubbing, and we, we see that in around 30% of our patients presented with lung cancer, and particularly pertinent in primary care, these abnormal investigations, spirometry. We all know the difficulty in getting spirometry now, but thrombocytosis or raised plate important. It's got a very strong link with cancer. In, in one study, the prevalence of cancer um, it, well, in patients with cancer diagnoses, 11% of males and 6% of females actually had evidence of thrombocytosis. And this is actually as high as 30% of patients with lung cancer have a thrombocytosis. We know that that itself is a negative predictor. If the, the higher the, thrombocyte, the, the thrombocytosis, the higher the platelet count is the, the, typically the worst the prognosis and is typically associated with in primary care, checking the platelet count um, is an important thing. I go on to my next slide. That last slide really in that study underpins which patients we should really be investigating. And really the big highlight of my talk is get a chest X-ray, get these patients to have a chest X-ray urgently, because that is a very, very useful tool to get your patients in to, uh, into the system and, and diagnosing lung cancer. These six symptoms, cough, fatigue, breathlessness, chest pain, weight loss, and appetite loss. In a non-smoker, if you have two or more of those symptoms, then an x-ray should be sought very urgently. Likewise, if you're a smoker, then that goes down to one because of the additive risk of smoking. Um, so really getting that rapid x-ray is really important. Um, obviously, then, if you've got other symptoms like persistent or recurrent chest infections, which may be because of a of a tumour obstructing a bronchus. Finger clubbing, as mentioned before, high association with, with lung cancer. Lymph nodes in the neck, N3 disease could well be an underpinning lung cancer. Or if you've got chest signs, for example, dullness to percussion, reduced breath sound, you think you've got an effusion, get a chest X-ray. I'm sure you know all this, but the important thing is getting that X-ray early and looking at that platelet count, maybe a take home message a day, look at that platelet count is important. So I can have my next slide. A lot of people ask me, how about x-rays? Are they actually any good? You know, it's a very blunt tool these days. Everyone gets a CT. Um, and this one study in 2006 in primary care showed actually that 23% of their cohort of patients who presented with lung cancer had a negative chest x-ray. We did a, a similar study looking at our, all our patients who presented with lung cancer to our MDT in 2011 and 2012. And that showed actually about 7% of those patients had a negative x-ray. But actually, when we looked at those with a, a radiologist who was blinded to the initial report, it actually showed that they weren't actually negative chest x-rays. They were probably just misreported. The cancer was hiding away, as seen in these pictures, behind the clavicle, behind the heart, behind the hilum, difficult to locate areas, which if you do a CT, it's very obvious. So it may not be actually that this x-ray is negative, it's just that the radiologist report is not accurate. And that's why, again, a message from this is don't always take the report as being gospel. It's just a report. It's subjective. It can be incorrect. It may, you could still need to get extra 
investigations done. Next slide. X-rays really laboring the point, but it is very important. Uh, the number of x-rays we, we've requested through primary care have gone up exponentially over the years. We did a lot of work in 2012 uh, with lung awareness campaigns to try and promote x-rays in the community. And that worked in increasing the number of x-rays we we're doing. And there was a year on year increase. Um, the next slide. That's gone on through the years, peaking in 2019 up to 61,000 uh, chest x-rays in Lyra and Bever and done in outpatients via primary care. Um, but again, COVID-19 has torn this apart and there's been last year a 25% reduction in those x-rays being done. And that's consistent with the advice given people not presenting and thus reducing our abilities to, to see these, to, to, to perform these patients, patients not coming forward. So really we need to turn that tide again and go back to doing what we were doing before. So I go back to my next slide. Once you've got your abnormal chest x-ray, then they should be referred in directly to your local uh, lung cancer service. I mentioned before that hemoptysis has a high positive predictive value of cancer. And if you have someone presenting with hemoptysis, don't do an x-ray, refer them straight in. If that hemoptysis cannot be explained, they're above the age of 40, then they should go on and have a CT scan initially because of that high positive predictive value and the likelihood of cancer with it. Likewise, if they get two or more episodes, even more so. There's this gray area about those with a chest X-ray, which is normal, but a high suspicion of cancer remains. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a following slide. Like my next slide. We've been seeing patients all the way through face to face, even despite this being on COVID wards. Um, we've been kind of getting changed, getting washed, coming out, doing uh, our lung cancer clinics as usual. A lot of patients have been scared to come, as I'm sure they have been coming to GP practices. We've been doing some telephone consultations with them or reassuring them about the pathways that we've had. So they have been ongoing. And I know that in other health boards, Cardiff, Comtab has been the same. I think it is important if you can see these patients in primary care face to face, telling them the information um, that they've been found, examining them also discussing things like smoking cessation. The sooner things like that start, the better, because we know that there are better outcomes if patients stop smoking. My next slide. Um, I'd like to try a bit of audience participation if I can, just to, to gauge your, your current practices. Um, if you have a patient with an abnormal chest X-ray, it's come through suspicion of cancer. I wanna know what you would do in, these, uh, in this situation. Um, would you request an urgent CT thorax abdomen um, and await the report via primary care? Secondly, would you refer them directly in so the respiratory team can then deal with getting the CT and further investigation? Or would you look at what the radiologist has reported and then go by what they say with regards to your next test? So if you could answer this, that would be interesting to know what your current practice is. if we've got a reply there. So referring directly, excellent. That's the answer I wanted. Um, having spoken to colleagues, Helen Davis in Cardiff, for example, and colleagues in Kumtav, basically what we want is for these patients to come directly into our service. We can then rapidly access CT. There are pathways down where we can get that done within 72 hours in, in secondary care, get them into clinic within the same week rather than actually going through a more laborious pathway outside of the hospital where you don't guarantee that you get that CT in a timely manner. Okay, great. I go on to my next slide. Just going through what we've been doing with our diagnostics, really chest x-rays have been ongoing in primary care, uh, sorry, in secondary care with walking uh, testing. Um, and that's important now to, to, to think about getting those patients back into the system. CT, we probably had better access to that because of less routine work. There's no delays with that now. Lung function testing and spirometry has really been culled in, in primary care because of the fact it's an AGP, which is difficult. We had similar problems, but it's now restarted, although less tests being done because of the rest period between each cases. Uh, we're still doing face-to-face -face clinic, as I mentioned. 
investigations, peripheral lesions, we would do a CT guided biopsy. We were asking patients to self-isolate for up to 14 days at the height of the pandemic. That's been slimmed down these three days after a negative COVID uh, test, and that's ongoing. Bronchospebus, we've been doing this all the way through the pandemic, no delays, a lot more laborious doing it in full PPE, a uh, lot longer dwell time between cases, but these tests have been ongoing and important to get your patient, to get our patients through PET scans done in Cardiff, really to give us information on staging these patients and important for those patients where we consider radical treatment. That's been ongoing, but with slightly greater delays. And with pleural disease, we've still been doing outpatient pleural work in Nanai and Bevan. It's run by our nurse specialists who can see patients uh, within the, the next day of referral uh, for diagnostics, aspirations, large volume aspirations for symptom relief. And we've been putting in tunneled indwelling pleural catheters via our nurse-led service as well. And I think that's really important. And I know in Cardiff that Helen Davis there runs a consultant-led service, and that's also been ongoing all the way through with a rapid service with that. So I think it's important to have these local things going on. Um, the next slide. Just coming to the end, within Wales, uh, each tumour site really has had these national optimal pathways and lung cancer is similar. What that's trying to do is really trying to make sure the patients who come into the system are diagnosed, investigated and managed as quickly as possible, trying to make sure everything is definitely done within 62 days and less than that. And lung cancer is no different. If I have my next slide, that will show what happens in with regards to the front end, the important end really. When you see a patient and an X-ray is done, they will then get referred into us. We will triage them and arrange for a CT scan to be done within 72 hours, ideally reported during the time. That's the aspiration. So really getting those patients into us is really important. We will get that done. And I'm sure that's what you, most of you are doing and really just to highlight that. And then we will get cracking with diagnosing, investigate them as soon as possible. And my final slide then, I did mention those patients perhaps with a normal chest x-ray where perhaps you think, well, actually, I think this patient's got cancer and that hunch in primary care is very intuitively important and has been shown in studies to be important and, and uh, that diagnostic acumen. We've had this vague symptom rapid diagnostic clinic running in Nyan Bevan for the last three months. And that's for those patients with a normal chest x-ray, for example, which have got weight loss or other symptoms which you're very concerned about. They come to this clinic um, and they have investigations. They've got rapid access to services such as CT tap, and that can then allow us to make a timely diagnosis of cancer. 8% eight eight percent of patients who've come through that service in the last three months have been diagnosed with lung can with cancer, sorry, um, and also other significant conditions which have been manageable have been diagnosed. So that's something I know we have in Naira Bevan, I know they have in Comtav. It might be something coming soon to Cardiff and Vale, but something to look out for is maybe a way of dealing with these cancer patients or suspected cancer patients. So that's all I have to say uh, for my part of the talk. Um, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. So I'll hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Mick Button now. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, really good summary. Um, just like I say, we're replicating that rapid diagnostic centre, uh, rapid diagnostic clinic with a rapid review clinic for palliative radiotherapy as needed. Uh, so trying to join things up across the system, if you like. Um, so I'm going to carry on the story and cover what happens once we've made a diagnosis of lung cancer. And as Matt says, um, patient fitness is really important in what we can offer. Um, so I think staging fitness and patient wishes are all key. Uh, a quick pathway is important uh, because patients are obviously and understandably very worried about things, but also we do see things like stage migration and fitness deteriorating if we don't do things fast. So, so speed is really important. I think it's really important to highlight, as Matt said, that our services have been open throughout all stages of the pandemic. Uh, we have made changes to try and keep everybody safe, uh, patients, uh, general society and population and, and staff. Uh, but we've been giving systemic therapy and radiotherapy throughout seeing patients in clinic. And I'd just like to say thank you to everybody in the NHS, whatever their role, uh, whether it be clinical, non-clinical, primary, secondary care, tertiary care, uh, who've kept things open for patients. It's been a huge achievement and, and thank you to everybody. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on the non-surgical management, but we shouldn't forget the role of surgery, uh, which does 
provide an important curative treatment uh, for a small proportion of patients who have early stage cancer and who are fit enough. It's about one in eight patients coming through our MDT um, might, might have an operation for their cancer rather than non-surgical treatments. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about radiotherapy, uh, which can be helpful in, in palliating and improving symptoms in the advanced stage uh, or in the curative setting. Uh, we have something called stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy now, uh, which can give surgery probably a run for its money in selected patients for, for very early cancers. Uh, the mainstay of my talk, though, is going to be around uh, systemic therapy, mainly focused around non-small cell lung cancer, as that's where the bulk of developments have been. And most of that is in the non-curative setting. Uh, but there have been similar developments in small cell and mesothelioma, but, but less, lesser impact at the moment. Uh, next slide, please, Charlotte. Uh, so these are just some pictures of a, a, a young lady who came through clinic very recently. She was diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer. Uh, she presented with a, with a lot of hip pains. Um, just next slide, please, Charlotte. Uh, she had uh, a lytic expansile metastasis in the uh, inferior pubic ramus, which was really affecting her ability to look after her children and walk. Um, she had a biopsy, uh, which showed lung cancer. And when we're thinking about the different systemic therapy treatments, we try not to use the word chemotherapy now because there are lots of different treatments. We've got a lot of options ahead of us. Uh, tablets, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, a combination. That takes a while to get through to. We're, we're working on getting it done as quickly as possible. But there's another range of tests that have to be done on the cancer to know which treatment might be optimal. And, and this lady's struggling with pain. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we saw her in clinic. We had palliative care team involvement already, which was fantastic. Uh, she's on analgesia to try and control things. And we've offered a single fraction of palliative radiotherapy. There's just some images there from our planning scan, uh, a beam from the front, a beam from the back with a bit of shielding in the corners to reduce side effects from treating normal tissues. And we hope that will be effective for her to improve her pain. I've given her a bit of steroid as well because pain flare sometimes happens with palliative radiotherapy. But just for a single treatment, uh, two visits for your cancer, to the cancer center as an outpatient, both quite quick can give very rapid palliation of symptoms, and then we can get on to the other drug treatment. Next slide, please. So radiotherapy is quite uh, a flexible treatment. This is a slide from someone with a very early lung cancer on the left at the back. And this is an example of the stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy. Much more complex to do, uh, but relatively simple from a patient perspective. You know, we can offer a very big dose of radiotherapy and quite a small number of treatments sometimes as little as three treatments, which is different to the very long courses of treatment, of radiotherapy treatment that are typically expected. And this could all be done as an outpatient without general anesthetic and give very good cure rates uh, for, for early stage lung cancer. It does come with a risk of side effects. Uh, quite a lot of the lung might get treated, which can cause shortness of breath or cough. And the chest wall treatment can, can give people risk of, of chest wall pains or even rib fractures in the future. But it's it can be a very effective treatment, uh, for example, patients who are not fit for a general anaesthetic or surgery. Next slide, please, Charlotte. So focusing on the systemic therapy a little bit more, um, a big advance over the last five or 10 years has been oral targeted therapy. Often lots of different names, they end in NIB generally because they're inhibitors uh, and they're generally tablets. So this is some scans of a uh, a 49 year old lady who presented with back pain, no chest symptoms actually, no weight loss, um, still working, fit and healthy, good performance status, uh, non-smoker, and she had a metastasis in the, in the mid thoracic spine, which was just beginning to indent the cord a little bit. She had a biopsy of the right-sided lung cancer, which showed non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. And in this sort of situation where someone doesn't have a smoking history, we do think about a subset of patients who have what we call a, a driver mutation, which can be the causative factor of their lung cancer. And we can treat that with different tablets these days. So similar to the last lady, uh, we gave her some radiotherapy for pain control. Uh, we put her on some bone targeted treatment to try and strengthen her bones. And then she went on to a tablet called Gefitinib. Uh, she had an excellent response. Uh, sadly, her cancer then progressed and she developed brain metastases, but then she went on to second line tablet treatment with, with another drug called ozimertinib and had a complete response in her brain and good symptom control. Um, sadly, her cancer then did relapse and she has died, but she had probably about two and a half years of good cancer control. Uh, despite presenting with um, spine and cord problems, she was never admitted to hospital. 
Uh, she only had one cycle of chemotherapy during the whole treatment. Uh, so she had outpatient based tablet treatment uh, throughout and stayed at home and was looked after at home. Next slide, please, Charlotte. So the targeted treatment, the tablet treatment, there's lots of different options. Uh, they're growing every year. There's different acronyms and names. Um, at the moment, we can easily target four different uh, uh, genetic abnormalities, uh, but there's research into even more. Um, we can treat first and second line. Uh, it does require genetic analysis of the tumor. And just to reassure everybody, that's looking at somatic, not germline mutation. So this isn't a risk to family. Uh, and we can do it on something called a circulating tumor DNA on a blood test these days, which is, is quite nice because sometimes these uh, can be difficult to biopsy. It's mainly in the non-curative setting, uh, but there is data coming through uh, in the curative setting, potentially after surgery. And patients might be on these treatment for years, even with stage four lung cancer. So bal balancing quality of life and side effects, which sometimes can be a burden, uh, is important. But generally, you get better response rates with these because they are targeted for the patient and their cancer. And quality of life is better than cytotoxic chemotherapy. But they're only of benefit to a small subset of patients. Only about 10% of patients with non-small cell lung cancer have a type of cancer where these these works and it's usually patients with adenocarcinoma and non-smokers. Uh, next slide please Charlotte. So a bigger impact at the moment is immunotherapy. Again fitness is a, is a major driver for this because um, we can only really offer Im immunotherapy to people who are uh, up and about active and independent. Uh, so these are just some x-rays of a, a lady who presented with stage four lung cancer, a bulky tumor on the right and she's had a combination chemo immunotherapy with, a, with an excellent response, which has been durable over 12 months. Um, we did look for the geno genetics and targeted treatments, but they weren't appropriate for her. Um, immunotherapy is given a bit like chemotherapy. It's intravenous treatment. Uh, it usually ends in names with a, a MAB because it's a monoclonal antibody. Uh, again, there's lots of different drugs on the market. Um, can be very well tolerated, but can cause significant side effects, which can present at any time, early on in someone's treatment after six or 12 months, or even after they finish. Uh, I think Dr. Fraze is gonna pick up some of the uh, toxicity management uh, in his talk later in the series of these webinars. So I won't go into that too much now, but patients can be on this immunotherapy for years sometimes. Um, you know, dramatic improvements in survival and quality of life, which is, is you know, unseen in, in lung cancer treatment previously. Thanks, Charlotte. So it's not just about controlling cancer. Uh, these are some scans, a PET scan uh, with a, a glowy area of a patient with a stage three lung cancer, uh, too big for surgery, uh, probably invading the mediastinum. So he had chemo radiotherapy to treat that right upper lobe tumor and then went on to have immunotherapy afterwards, something called adjuvant immunotherapy. Uh, 18 months later, his cancer is well controlled. Uh, the CT there does show some fibrosis and shrinkage of the right lung, but no active tumor. And he's at work carrying on. Um, he's more short of breath than before, uh, but he's alive and pretty well. Uh, next slide, Charlotte. And the combination of giving chemotherapy and radiotherapy and then immunotherapy afterwards really does improve control and cure rates. Uh, we're now looking at patients with stage three lung cancer their three-year survival, if they can have all of this. If, you know, if they have the chemo radiotherapy, they've got about a four in 10 chance of being alive in three years. If you add in immunotherapy, it goes up to six in 10 near enough, which is a, a massive increase, a very meaningful benefit. But patients need to be fit enough. And again, only the minority of patients are treated in this way, uh, often due to bulk of disease and fitness. So presenting early, uh, managing fitness, uh, supporting them before treatment with prehab and through treatment, as Alison's going to talk about in a, in a moment, is really key. You can only add in immunotherapy for these patients if they're well after their chemo radiotherapy. Uh, and we're keen to give these, these significant improvements in survival for as many patients as we can. Next slide, please. But it's not about survival curves. It's not about scans. It's about people and trying to help them lead longer, happier, healthy, positive lives so they can do things like they, that they want to do, like doing their painting and their art, seeing family or playing the trumpet, as is the case of some of my patients. Uh, they've given me permission to share these pictures. And it really is about the people that we look after and giving them those extra options and uh, you know, the benefits from that. Treatments are getting more complex. Uh, there is a benefit, but we do need to be very careful. 
there is a greater burden to patients and everybody involved in treatment through that. Can we just move on to the next slide, Charlotte? Um, and that burden can be felt in primary care, in secondary care, in A&E, MAU, radiology, oncology. So joining things up, I think, is really important. Um, but I, we, we're seeing different things in lung cancer treatments that we haven't seen before. You know, some patients being on treatment for years rather than just months and having survival, which is measured in, in years rather than months. And I've got patients coming to the end of their two years of immunotherapy with no detectable lung cancer on their scans and they're well. And that, that's really amazing to see. Uh, fitness is really key. Um, you know, you can do more for a fitter patient. So that early referral, as Matt said, maintaining fitness before and, after, before and during treatment with prehab, uh, which Alison is going to mention. Um, and a lot of this is, is about what we do when the patients first come through, but actually we've got options if a patient's had treatment and then they might relapse from their lung cancer. Uh, so referral back in, and alison has been doing some work around end of treatment summaries to help with that. Again, how we join things up together is really important. Um, you've got enough work in primary care. Um, you do a fantastic job and manage all sorts of different things that I can't even comprehend. So we don't expect you to be experts in this, but I do believe that you know, better communication, better team working, uh, better knowledge in both directions, um, from you to us as well, would lead to, to, to better clinical care. And I, I always really value it and enjoy it when I speak to a, uh, a patient's uh, primary care team. Uh, sorry, that's my alarm going off to tell me to be quiet. Uh, just to join up the care decisions because uh, things are getting more complex. So, you know, maybe, you know, do take opportunities to talk to your, your oncology teams if, if that comes up. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, I'll hand over to Alison, who will talk a bit more about some of those themes I've picked up. And then I think we've got time for questions and answer at the end. Thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Button. So um, as Lise previously introduced me, my name's Alison. I'm the lung cancer specialist nurse at the Lundra Cancer Centre in South Wales. Um, I thought I would, I don't have any slides today, but I just thought I'd have a brief discussion about on the two areas that Dr. Button's mentioned, so rehabilitation and treatment summaries, which I think are really excellent areas where sort of secondary care specialist oncology services and primary care can work together to hopefully improve the outcomes for our shared patient group. So the first thing I wanted to touch on was prehabilitation. So historically, patient care was focused around a lot around the idea of rehab or rehabilitation. So essentially providing an intervention to a patient and then looking to improve patient's health and fitness following the intervention, trying to get things back up to baseline. What we've now tried to focus on more, particularly on oncology care, is the idea of prehabilitation. So intervening early on before any interventions, trying to improve and optimise patient fitness and health before we actually provide any sort of treatments, any operations, etc., just to make sure that we can get patient care as high as we possibly can before we then deliver that intervention. And it's shown to have lots of excellent positive benefits. So a lot of the work around prehabilitation focused on surgery initially. So it showed a lot of different benefits, so particularly around reducing length of hospital stay, reducing post-operative complications, et cetera. So it was showing a real benefit in that patient group. There's been a lot of recent publications and reports around prehabilitation. So I will pop in the chat afterwards. I think there was quite a big report and some guidance from Macmillan last year. So I'll pop that in the chat at the end of the talk. But as I said, it is quite a, a new and emerging area, which we're finding sort of a lot more evidence based for at the moment. We have moved away a little bit from just focusing on surgical patients. So we do now know that there's actually quite a lot of value in prehabilitation, even for patients that may end up having treatment with palliative intent. So originally a lot of the evidence I think was around surgical prehab, but now we are trying to move, particularly in secondary care services, more towards prehab for the wider range of sort of patient groups. As Dr. Button mentioned, that's particularly important nowadays in lung cancer because we do have multiple lines of treatment options available to some patients. So we have treatment packages, that are essentially sequential treatments. So it may be chemotherapy and radiotherapy together, followed by immunotherapy. In order to access immunotherapy, 
we have to make sure patients stay well enough during the first line of treatment to then move on to the next treatment option of, as part of that package. I think Dr. Button also alluded to the fact that some of our treatments are now available to patients potentially for several years, whereas historically maybe we provided chemotherapy or radiotherapy for a period of weeks or months. Certain treatments such as the oral treatments or immunotherapy are actually licensed for several years. So maintaining that baseline fitness level for patients has become even more critical now because we are treating them for many years potentially. I just wanted to touch briefly on some prehab work we've been doing specifically in Valindra. So I've recently set up a joint rehabilitation group with some of our therapies team. So it's a virtual clinic, which is run between myself, occupational therapy, dietitian, physiotherapist and speech and language therapist. And what we're aiming to do is we try and identify patients as early as possible in the secondary care oncology setting. We then offer them access to our virtual clinic where we can have a full discussion with them, a full assessment of any needs they may have, try and identify any problems which they may have and try and optimise those areas before they start treatment. But critically, as Dr Button alluded to, it's about providing ongoing treatment and care for these patients in terms of supportive and prehabilitation work as well. So once we've met them in the virtual clinic, each of the therapies teams and myself will then have our own individual follow-up with these patients to ensure that even if they don't necessarily have any specific needs that we need to address at that point, we have a good supportive relationship with them. So that way, if any problems do occur during their treatment pathway, they have nice easy access back into specialist services and supportive care to make sure that we can hopefully tackle any problems as quickly as possible when they come up. I think I just wanted to mention that I know there's been a lot of discussion about secondary care trying to maintain services and keep things open during the COVID period. I think the prehab clinic is an excellent example of actually new and innovative ways of working that we've developed during COVID. So as well as keeping things open, we've actually developed new ways of working as well. And I was actually informed today that we've successfully been awarded another 12 months funding from Welsh Government to continue our prehab clinic. So I'm really hoping it's something that we continue to develop over the next 12 months. Obviously prehab, as well as being run in secondary care, has got a critical role in primary care as well. And I think there's probably excellent day-to-day -day work that is going on in primary care, which is massively supportive of rehabilitation. So things like smoking cessation, alcohol use management, physical activity levels, nutrition, blood pressure management. So a lot of really important day-to-day -day work that I know goes on in primary care all has a really critical, important aspect in terms of feeding in to prehabilitation and so just getting that patients as well as we can getting that baseline fitness level as high as possible all the way through so we can continue this work all the way through the diagnostic pathway so when they come to secondary services if they do need specialist treatment they're in the best position as possible hopefully to carry those things forward but I think prehab is something that's been developing over the past few years and as I said I think everyone has a really important role to play in it it's something that we can start as early as possible in the patient pathway and then hopefully continue throughout their journey in secondary care. Can I just reiterate that for you Alison is that okay? Yes of course. Yeah so I think you know just from the conversations I've had around prehab in Wales generally over the last couple of years I mean it, I think in primary care I, I would call myself guilty of this you know if you are concerned about cancer in anyone you know the main important thing is to refer them to the on the USC pathway and perhaps we're then a bit blinkered about the other things and really the point you're making there is that that is the time to optimize so if you think this person has cancer and actually even if they don't they are actually at that point really interested in improving their health they're worried about their health so there's a teachable moment there isn't there where we might be able to get them to stop smoking or to you know look at weight and diet and exercise and things like that because that's actually something they can do in this time where they've got very little control over things and I know that it, you know I could reference myself for another example like if you have someone with um, anemia and a low iron count and you're further on a, on a GI pathway I didn't know that I was meant to correct the anemia kind of adding iron tablets there and then but actually if they have a full blood count you know normal blood count at the time they might offer surgery where they wouldn't have otherwise and similarly with lung cancer if they're not smoking if they're more mobile if they've got a better lung capacity by doing a little bit more exercise rather than doing nothing it might put them up in their performance status so it is really important in primary care to try and start things whilst you're doing that referral process and I think that was a really important point at least as well in terms of 
um, giving patients skills and confidence in terms of a time when they feel that they have no control over anything. So it's promoting self-care, self-efficacy, self-management sort of, of health conditions. And although we've mentioned a lot of physical health areas in terms of prehab, sort of psychological prehab is extremely important for our patients as well, because a lot of the patients we get coming through the prehab clinic are maybe have pre-existing anxiety problems or low mood. And I think and the diagnosis of cancer can often exacerbate that. And it leaves a lot of these patients struggling in terms of lack of coping skills, lack of resilience, et cetera. So giving them the tools to try and continue to optimize their own health. And as you say, give them control over some aspect of that, I think is really important. So I think that's that's definitely something that's really helpful for our patient group as well. Yeah, so. The other one is obviously that, you know, less than 10 percent of those you refer will have lung cancer. But if you've optimised the health yes. of the other 90 percent, that's another gain for us. Yeah. who never come to you. Anyway, yeah. carry on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the other thing I was just going to touch on, which I think is a really important link between sort of oncology, secondary care, specialist services and primary care is, as Dr. Button briefly mentioned, is the role of treatment summary. So. Belindra has done a few sort of pilot projects with treatment summaries over the past few years. And essentially what they are is a, a document which in terms of content and length varies quite widely. I've been to a few other cancer centers in the UK and have seen how widely these vary, but they're essentially documents which is, can be used as tools to communicate about a patient's treatment episode with the patient and also with important other healthcare providers such as GP, or palliative care teams, or anyone else who might be involved in the community in patient's care. So essentially what they should cover in some way, shape or form is a description of the patient's treatment episode. So what treatment have they had, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, what specific regimes did they have? How long did it last? What was the intent? Um, what we try to do as well with the treatment summaries is particularly for our primary care colleagues is some of the things that we found they said might be quite important is information around, as Dr. Button alluded to, long-term side effects from treatment, particularly new treatments like immunotherapy. So if a patient presents to primary care with an unusual symptom, et cetera, there's some evidence there for the primary care team about whether or not we may expect this to be related to the oncology treatment they've had. There's also important information that we put in the treatment summary in terms of, for example, some of our patients that are at risk of cord compression. So certain red flags that our community partners have to be mindful of when they see patients who aren't on treatment. As Dr Button also mentioned again about one of the key areas that the treatment summary can help with is sort of progression and relapse for patients cancer so they may have a treatment episode they may then go back to health board care or support from their GP. It's very important obviously for us to make people aware of what options might be available for the patient in the future so if a patient does relapse or if they have an imaging which suggests that they may need oncology input again, treatment summary can be a really valuable tool in letting, as I said, primary care or other people know if there are actually further treatment options available for the patient and what they may be or whether a decision has been made that best supportive care is the best route for that patient. I think we did a small treatment summary pilot, myself and one of the specialist nurses from St Wooler, so covering the Royal Gwent area. We did find that it was a very helpful tool for both patients and primary care. Primary care said they found it a very good summary of what treatment episode patients have had. Obviously, we do communicate regularly with primary care with letters, etc., from clinic, but sometimes a single document that just summarises things can be very helpful. Um, patients also found it very useful as well, particularly patients who'd had multiple lines of treatment, because again, it was just a summary in terms of what to potentially expect going forward in terms of their follow-up and their care plan. Also, as I said, red flags for the patient in terms of things that they may want to watch out for. And also importantly, contact details. So the patient is aware going forward, who is the best person to contact? Who can they speak to if they need any further support? Um, I think Lise, you wanted to talk briefly as well about um, treatment summary work. Yeah, just very briefly. Time, but thank you very much, Alison. So there is an all Wales piece of work going ahead with this. So um, hopefully it will come to you wherever you are in Wales for um, your patient having cancer treatment. 
Um, but what's most important is you code it. Um, so just coding, because obviously these files, are, letters are often held in different files. So just code that the treatment summary has been received so you know where to find it. And in our patches, you might put like a yellow alert box to say treatment summary and the date of it, because um, you know the side effect stuff that you need to know when you need to know about it is quite hard to find if it's three years ago in a treatment summary received from 2018. So just the coding of it's really helpful. But thank you, Alison. I know Fiona's been keeping an eye on the chat. We've just got sort of five minutes for questions. I mean, particularly from some of the things that Matt said that I think would be relevant for primary care, you know, in her, terms of his referral. You know, when, when we're referring, mean, what worries me is, is that we don't see so many people in primary care these days. And some of his red flags referral were things like um, finger clubbing and weight loss. And I, and I genuinely worry that the amount we manage over the phone, we don't pick up some of these more subtle signs. Um, so that was one of the things that I'm going to try and be more aware of, particularly when I'm seeing patients to think to weigh them when I'm there with them, the times that I do see them in, even for something else. Yeah, I think a weight is really useful. If they lost, you know, 10% of their body weight, I think that's a real big issue, isn't it? And I think uh, for us, I always look at weight when I get referrals, look at the GP letters with their weight compared to ours. So it's a, it's a big thing, really, weight loss and thrombocytosis and clubbing. Yeah, big things to look at, really. Matt, there was a question that you on on the chat around um, commissioning PET scans, and you you were going to just make a comment on that. Would you like to do that now? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, within Wales, PET scans are easily attainable as long as they fulfil the current kind of PET guidelines. Getting uh, scans, I think the the case that was discussed on the chat was that somebody was living across the border, um, getting their treatment in England, but the the, the PET scan had been commissioned in Wales. I mean. Uh, it's difficult to comment on individual cases like that. I guess there is a centre in Cheltenham, to my to my knowledge, and where certainly where we used to send our patients back many years ago. Um, yeah, difficult. Uh, it's difficult to comment, as I say, on difficult cases. I mean, if if it's really a big issue, then going back to you know your provider then and, and asking whether that could be done more locally would probably be the way forward. But um, you know, a lot of our patients are asked to travel quite significant distances for PET scans, all done in Cardiff at the moment. And, and given the, the nature of the test, I think a lot of them are willing to, to go on that one occasion. Can I just ask a question actually of, 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 of Mick as well? Thank you. Um, which is just, just occasionally, Mick, when I'm, I'm, I'm a, a palliative medicine consultant in the community and we see people who may have had some radiotherapy for hemoptysis and it's, it's kind of nearly got rid of it, but not, but not quite. And so when we are on seeing the patients, you know, for follow up, they'll still mention hemoptysis, which varies in amount. Is that something that kind of would would we be having alerts for that and sending people expediting clinic appointments, or is it just something to sort of to keep an eye on? Um, gosh, you're asking me a question about leading into radiotherapy retreatment and radiobiology with only a few minutes left on the webinar. Oh. That's very dangerous, you know. <laughs> um, I think clinically, yes, it is something to worry about. Um, I mean, anybody with hemoptysis from a lung cancer is at risk of major hemoptysis, which can be a, a life-threatening event. And mm. that can be really upsetting for the, the patient and carers. Mm. Um, there are simple things that can be done like tranexamic acid, um, uh, exploring what else might be happening. You know, they could have an infection or a PE as a cause for hemoptysis, so having a bit of a differential. Mm -hmm. um, there may be other treatments. I, I mean, they might be under your care, but they may also be fit for systemic therapy. So, you know, is there an option to, to bring their cancer under control more generally? Um, mm -hmm. It's something for us to get involved with. Um, I often see a little bit of hemoptysis post radiotherapy. It doesn't always settle completely. Uh, but radiotherapy mm. can be very effective. Mm. And oftentimes there is scope for retreatment with radiotherapy uh, or potentially, depending on your, your, your local teams, um, you might have something like a, a brachytherapy or endobronchial treatments, laser treatments and things like that through the surgeons or the respiratory teams. Mm. So I think if someone has got ongoing hemoptysis that you're worried about clinically, I'd, I'd definitely have a chat with your, your diagnostic or treatment teams and, and see what can be, can be offered. Great, thank you. The other thing that I've picked up, Elise, from something that you were saying when discussing with Alison is I love the concept of teachable moments. And I think the last of the series of the webinars, we're going to be looking at co communication skills and general sort of top tips to manage any of these situations that we've, we've talked about. And the concept of teachable moments, but actually getting the communication skills right 
for that teachable moment is can can you build on how that patient is feeling at the time I think there's quite an art to that isn't there so I'm looking forward to kind of bringing everybody's skills together in a fairly discussive uh, final session um, we've got literally a couple more minutes to go I've hogged the questions so far Elise I don't know if there's anything else that you want to you can, no, I'm happy. I can just well, see there is a hands up in the chat I don't know whether we can bring a a delegate in but Catherine has got a hand up in the chat so there's a question there Catherine can you Charlotte she able to speak I don't know Catherine you can be able to speak now if you want to say your question she looks like she's on mute from where I am still yeah you need to unmute yourself Catherine no oh hand's gone down <laughs> Yeah, no, just grateful for everyone for their time and, and thank you for attending. The next one, I think we had a slide to show it, didn't we, is um, skin um, conditions next week and then um, malignancy of unknown origin and the rapid diagnosis centres in two weeks' time. And as Fiona said, three weeks' time um, about difficult conversations and, and teachable moments. There is one final question before we go, if we can. Sorry, Fiona, I'm asking about spirometry remaining as the gold standard in light of COVID, please. Any last minute quick fire responses. Probably answer with that. Um, um, Thank you, Matt. Well, obviously, still consider an AGP. I think that may well change in the future. I think um, that's always been something that's been consistently reviewed. Um, with regards to before coming into hospital, no, it's not uh, before refer. We don't uh, anticipate that patients will have a spirometry. We will do that. We have uh, the ability to do spirometry and lung fun and full lung function testing. We have about an hour downtime between patients as well to let everything settle down. So we wouldn't expect that to accompany a referral. I know it's difficult diagnosing airways, disease more and more now. So a lot of that is done by symptoms, radiology, um, you know, in asthma, peak flow, readings, et cetera. So the answer to that is no in lung cancer, but appreciate it's very difficult now. And we can offer within our help or certainly for GPs routine spirometry for other conditions if we're really desperate for those as well. All right. So I think that brings us to a brings the session to a close very neatly. Thank you all for attending. Um, and Charlotte, thank you very much for the CPD unit. Is there anything else you want to add as we finish? No, just a reminder to everybody to fill in the feedback form, please. And I'll also email around the recording. And apologies for the sound. I could hear it fine, but I don't know what was going on. But it, it will be on the recording for you to listen to. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks all to our fantastic speakers. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much.